about myself. I'm a mathematician. Um, I fell in love with Rubik's Cubes when I was 14. I actually fell in love with spirographs when I was six, if you want to go back that far. I thought of math as beautiful and true and honest and clarifying. And I had this really naive um, idea when I left being a professor at Barnard College and go went into finance in 2007. Whoa. Yeah. I was like, hey, we're gonna I'm going to bring mathematics and the clarity that mathematics shows us into the real world. And I went into finance in 2007. <laughs> And I walked into the end of the world. Um, I was a quant at DE Shaw. I worked with Larry Summers. Um, I ended up not liking very much what I was doing as a participant, but I also ended up being really disgusted and ashamed by what I saw there. And what I saw there was a mathematical lie. And I thought of math as something that brings clarity and truth, right? But a mathematical lie in the, in uh, what I mean by that is the AAA ratings of mortgage-backed securities. People trusted them. They thought that AAA meant that mathematicians were in the corner at, Mo at Moody's, Fitch, and S&P, the credit rating agencies, and they were like diligently working on their data, making sure things were safe. That was a lie. They were just selling those ratings for the money. But people trusted it because they trust math. And they're afraid of it because they're afraid of math. And that was the first example I had where instead of bringing, us, bringing the truth, mathematics was bringing corruption. It was hiding corruption. It was a shield. I decided to go into data science, get away from finance. I actually became a data scientist, started my blog, Math Babe, and joined Occupy in 20, 2011. And I, as a data scientist, I was like, well, phew, I'm away from finance, and now I can start making the world a better place instead of a worse place. But then I suddenly realized all the shit I would be, I've been seeing in finance was happening again in data science. But it was happening, in some sense, in a worse way. Because, and I never thought I'd find the positive in the financial crisis, but I did. The good thing about the financial crisis was everyone noticed. The world blew up, and everyone saw it. In data science, I realized that we were going to see lots and lots of individual people um, sort of shifted into the shadows. And they were, their lives were going to be slightly ruined or totally ruined by unfair algorithms, and we weren't going to notice because it was happening all the time to people that were essentially invisible. And I also realized that the hype around big data was totally misplaced, that instead of all these algorithms, they were marketed as true and objective and fair, but they were anything but that. They were actually opinions embedded in code. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. This is my son. He loves Nutella. Um, I, I, you know, many of you guys are already technical enough to know this, but I'm just going to explain really quickly an al what an algorithm is. Uh, and I'm going to play a little bit fast and loose with the technical details. I hope that's okay. Um, an algorithm is something that you make by coming up with lots of data and a definition of success. So when I cook dinner for my family, which I do daily when I'm not on book tour, um, the data I use to decide what that meal should be is the food I have in my kitchen the amount of time I have, the amount of ambition I have, that kind of the data. The definition of success for me is whether my, kid, my kids ate vegetables. OK, so two things about that. First of all, I am projecting my agenda, even onto the data collection itself, because I don't include all ingredients as, as pot, potential ingredients for my dinners. I don't include ramen noodles, even though my teenagers love ramen noodles. That's not really food to me. Pop-tarts don't count. They would think it does. I'm curating the data. The second thing is I'm defining success. I'm defining success as my kids eating vegetables. This guy would define success if he were in charge, as a, a dinner would be successful if he, he got to eat a lot of Nutella. And the reason, so that's my projecting my agenda onto my, my model. And every algorithm that's built out there, the person who's in charge of building the algorithm is also in charge of defining success. And they define success for themselves to be successful for the most part. They don't necessarily take into account other, other viewpoints. And the reason it matters so much is that when we have this data system and we have a definition of success, over time we optimize to success. So I'm much more likely in the future to redo a meal that was successful in the past. That's how we choose what to do next, is what looks like success to us. That's a different set of dinners for my family than it would be if my son were in charge. This is what is generally true, is that what I was noticing more and more, and I'm going to give you examples after this, 
was a sort of mathematical shield, and behind it, a bunch of people who were not necessarily representing the whole world, who were making these decisions and projecting their agenda and claiming that there was no agenda, that algorithms were somehow purely objective, that had somehow transcended morals. And it wasn't true, and I wanted to tell you guys, um, I wanted to tell the world what's, what was really going on. In the worst situations, these algorithms were doing truly horrifying things. So I wanted to alert the world to these horrifying things. And I should say that I do love algorithms and data science, and I still do that stuff. So I'm not claiming that we should throw out the field altogether, although you might be able to convince me of that. Um, what are these worst case algorithms? I call them weapons of math destruction, and they're characterized in three, with three properties. First, they are important and widespread. Nobody cares about the algorithm I use to cook dinner for my kids. Just not important. Second of all, they're secret. They're almost always scoring algorithms, scoring people. Like, if you have a good score, you're a winner. If you're a bad score, you're a loser in whatever system that it's, that it's related to. It separates people. It ranks people and scores them and just chooses whether they get the opportunity or they don't get the opportunity, whatever opportunity that is. And again, it has to be an important thing or else I wouldn't count it. It has to be widespread and important. Like, do you get the job? How long do you go to prison? How much do you pay for insurance? It has to be important. But it's, again, it's a scoring algorithm, and it's a secret scoring algorithm. People don't understand the, the formula by which they are scored. They often don't even understand that they are being scored. It's often invisible to them altogether. And I can give you examples of that. Along with the flip side of secrecy is the account, lack of accountability. There's no way to hold an, a, a formula accountable if you don't even know it exists. And if you don't know it exists, but you, it's secret, how can you appeal a mistake? You don't know a mistake's been made. It's unappeal, unappealable and unaccountable. The final characteristic is that it's destructive. I care about algorithms that are actually ruining people's lives. And as an observation, after I did a bunch of research, I noticed that another kind of destructiveness is actually happening, another kind of destruction, which is a larger feedback loop of destruction. That these algorithms not only, they often set out to have some kind of like big society-wide problem that they're gonna solve. They don't solve that problem. They actually make it worse. And we'll see examples. So the first example comes from education. And I'll, I want to make this short, so I'll just mention that we've had basically a two decades war on teachers in this country. And the idea is we're gonna get rid of the bad teachers and then all our problems are gonna go away. The problems typically are, what we talk about are, is the achievement gap, which is the fact that rich kids do better on standardized tests than poor kids. That's a very simplified version of it. Forgive me. And one last thing, one, th one detail I'll say is that over time, actually, everyone's gotten better at these tests at every level of poverty, but the gap it has increased as well. So this is the gap that we're worried about, we wanna get rid of it, and the theory, is that if we get rid of bad teachers, we will solve this problem. We don't have much evidence for that theory, but that has been the main theory. And the, what we've done is two things. We tried something and throw it away, and now we have a second version. The first version was really dumb. The first version was, let's decide, to, let's call a teacher bad, and we have to decide who's the bad teachers, right? Let's call a teacher bad if a lot of their students don't pass a certain proficiency level on their standardized test. Now, but I already told you there's a very strong correlation between poverty and standardized test scores. So what that does is puts a target on the back of teachers of poor kids. And that was the first try we went through, and it was obviously stupid and unfair, so we threw that out. So now we had a second try, second effort, and it's called the value-added teacher model. The idea here was, well, we can't hold a teacher accountable for not getting a kid who's really, really far behind up to grade level. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna have an expected score for each student, and then we're gonna hold the teacher accountable for the difference between their actual score and that expected score. And it's actually much more complicated than that, but that's the main idea. So if I'm a fifth grade teacher and you guys are my students, each of you will have modeled an expected score at the end of the year in their fifth grade. How will they decide what your expected score is? Partly due based on what your fourth grade score was, okay? Other things too, which school we're in, how many kids are in the class, how many kids 
get free school lunches, lots of lots of complicated things. Um, there's two sources of uncertainty. The first one is that expected score. It's actually really hard to get somebody's score in a year. The second problem is your actual score. Your actual score depends on whether you ate breakfast before taking the test, whether it was cold or air conditioned or hot in the room when you took the test, whether the test itself was hard or easy that year. So there's two sources of uncertainty, and what we're doing is we are taking the difference. So if you were expected to get a 75, but you actually got an 80, I'm given five points credit for you. But if you got a 70, I am dinged five points. And then we take all the kids in the class, usually about 25 kids, and we ding me or we benefit me for those differences. Now, since both of those numbers were uncertain, the difference between those numbers is even more uncertain, and we only have 25 data points. It's a shitty system. It's very, very shitty, statistically. <laughs> very shitty. But we don't know that because we aren't told anything about it. I, so the New York Post did this thing, which was crazy. They filed a Freedom of Information Act request and got all the teachers and all their scores, and they published it as an act of teacher shaming. Well, I figured, since they got the numbers, I should be able to get the formula. So I filed a Freedom of Information Act request asking for the formula, and I was denied. I finally reached the people that worked on the formula itself in Madison, Wisconsin, and they explained to me, nobody in New York City Department of Education has access to this by the contract we've written. Which is crazy, actually. And I was kind of stymied because I was like, well, how am I ever going to figure out whether this scoring system is any good if I can't look at the formula? Then somebody really smart, Gary Rubenstein, who's a high school math teacher at Stuyvesant, he did something smart. He took the data from the New York Post and he found 624 teachers who had two scores in the same year. His idea being like seventh grade math, eighth grade math, for example, they get two scores. If you're supposed to be a 70 out of 100 for seventh grade math, then for eighth grade math, maybe you should be like a 72 or a 68, right? So he graphed those teachers. <laughs> I love it when the punchline is a scatter plot. <laughs> so this is almost uniform distribution. This person here got an 88 and a zero. What this means is that there's very little consistency here. It's almost like a random number generator. It is almost like a random number generator. In spite of this, Sarah Wasaki got fired for her teacher assessment score in Washington, DC. Now, I should say that only 50% of her overall teacher assessment score was her value-added model score, but much more than 50% of the variance of her scoring was coming from that. The rest of it was principal evaluations, which the complaint was, always said the teacher was great. So they, that was what they were looking for. We want more ways of, of ranking these teachers than just having the principal evaluation. So they added this, and guess what? They got more ranking. It's just that it was kind of a random number generator. So she got fired, but I should mention she got hired next week, the following week, at an affluent suburb of Washington, D.C., which did not use this. Okay, and so that brings me to, well, let me just say one thing, which is that more than half the states use a value-added model, a version of it. It's also called a growth model. Um, and they often use it in urban school, so school districts. So that brings me to the larger destructive feedback loop. Remember what the original goal of this was? Get rid of bad teachers. I maintain that this is actually getting rid of good teachers. What's happening is good teachers in these settings are retiring early, they're quitting, they're getting pushed out and getting jobs at affluent school districts. And right now we have a national teacher shortage in no small part because of punitive regimes like this. This is another example, this is Kyle Beam. He took a personality test, um, he was a college student, straight A's in high school I should mention, took a, per a personality test to get a job, after school job, at Kroger's grocery store in Atlanta, Georgia. He failed it. He was actually special in two ways. The first one, first way he was special was he found out he failed the test. Most people never find out they failed these tests. I should mention 60% of job applicants in this country take personality tests. He, he found out because his friend worked at Kroger's and had actually told him he had the job, he just had to fill out the paperwork online. So when he didn't get the call, he was like, what happened? And he's like, oh, you got red-lighted from that test. 
He was also special in a second way. His father's a lawyer. Most people applying to minimum wage jobs do not have fathers that are lawyers, but he did. His father said, what kind of questions were on the test? And Kyle said, they were a lot like the questions I got when I was being treated for bipolar disorder at the hospital. And his father's like, well, that's not legal. It's not legal by the Americans with Disability Act for you to be forced to take a health exam, including a mental health exam, as part of a job application. So he sued a class action lawsuit against Kroger's for, on behalf of everyone who took that test on, that, on those grounds that it violated the ADA. I want to give you some sample of what kind of personality test questions there are. This is an old school one. Radio Shack used to give, and it's kind of easy to know how to answer it. You could game this. So do you agree or disagree, I'm always happy? What do you think Radio Shack wants you to say? <laughs> new, new fangled uh, personality tests are harder. What do you agree with more? I sometimes get confused by my thoughts and feelings, or I don't really like to have to do something I haven't done before. <laughs> So imagine answering 50 of these in an hour. This is the kind of personality test. It's opaque, you don't know what they want, and you often don't even know that you, you failed. I don't want you to think that this kind of applica job application algorithm it, only for people applying to minimum wage work because it's more and more being used in white collar work. So you guys know that Roger Ailes got kicked out of Fox News for making it impossible for women anchors to succeed. Um, I want to do a, a thought experiment with you, because we all are experts at machine learning now. Um, <laughs> imagine that Fox News is like, we're going we're gonna, to like shape up, OK? We're going to replace our hiring algorithm with a machine learning algorithm. And so everything's going to be copacetic. Everything's going to be fair and objective. OK, so what will that look like? Well, they're going to take all the data. They need data. Remember, data. Train the model. So they're going to take 20 years of applications for a job of anchor at Fox News. And they have to have a definition of success. Remember that. The definition of success. Who, who's a success at Fox News? Well, we'll just define it. Have to do something. Somebody who stays there for five years and is promoted twice. It's a reasonable way of doing it. Then they train that model. What happens? Well, it's trained on the last 20 years of successes and failures of people who got the job as anchors at Fox News. When you apply that trained model to the current pool of applicants, it's going to, not surprisingly, systematically filter out women. Because women will not look like the people that were successful in the past. So this is a very short version of explaining that machine learning algorithms are very, very good at repeating patterns, at finding patterns, and predicting their repetition. Um, they don't ask the question, why? They don't ask the question, why were women not f succeeding in this atmosphere? They just notice that women weren't succeeding, so they will predict that women will not succeed in the future. So it, basically, when you, when you apply a machine learning algorithm, you're automating past practices which would be great if we had a perfect way to hire people. But for as long as we have imperfect processes by which we hire people, if, as long as we have um, discrimination happening, then automating that just means we're freezing in place the mistakes that we've been making. The last couple examples are from criminal justice. And I think a lot of you guys probably know more than I do about this. But I'll tell you what I know. So there's a very uneven policing system. Um, and I spent a lot of time explaining the difference between arrest records and crime records. So arrest records are not crime records. Lots of crimes happen and are not noticed by the police. But in neighborhoods that have over-policing due to the broken windows policies, we have much less of that. So we have similar rates of smoking pot by whites and blacks but blacks are much more likely to be arrested for smoking pot. And this is a histogram which I find interesting of the, ex the extent of how much more likely blacks are to be arrested. Notice it really varies by precinct. It can be up to 10 times more often. So in other words, when you think about arrest records, you think crime, of course, but you also think police practices. Because police practices, changing police practices will change what kind of things, uh, what kind of arrest records you have. 
and the amount of bias in those arrest records. So what happens with predictive policing is they take arrest records and they don't distinguish between arrest records and crime records and they look at where the arrests occurred and they send the police back to those same places and say, go look for bad people. And what this does is it gives a scientific excuse, pseudoscientific excuse, to repeat and to continue um, over-policing of poor black communities. Um, I like to, another thought experiment I like to give here is, if after the financial crisis, the police had all been sent down to Wall Street to like empty the pockets of all the bankers and find all the cocaine in there, then the crime records would be, look, the arrest records would look very different and these predictive algorithms would say, go back to Wall Street. That's where the bad guys are. But we didn't do that. But that was a choice we made about how we police our city. So the population is at least 30,000. Oh, I don't know. I can give you a reference, though. I got this from Vox. You can find it there. So my basic point is that when you have bias in data and you don't acknowledge that there's a difference between arrest and crime, then these predictive policing algorithms just sort of continue and propagate um, the the policing, the uneven policing system we have. So final example, before I have some ideas and then we do questions. This is the one that kept me up at night, it's recidivism risk algorithms, which have, there's been a lot about that recently. Um, so recidivism risk is the risk of coming back to prison after people leave prison. And 97% of people who are in prison actually eventually leave, so the question is, do they come back? And Judges use, judges are given in some places, in more than half the, the country, they're given um, scientific recidivism risk scores for criminal defendants. And generally speaking, if they're, they're put into three categories, high risk, medium risk, and low risk, and if they're given a high risk, they are put into prison for longer. So right there, you could sort of take a detour and talk for an hour about the question of why we are preemptively punishing people before they've done anything else but that's the choice we've made. The problematic part of this isn't just that, but how these actually are created, these risk scores. So there's two different sources of data for the recidivism risk scores. The first um, comes from arrest records, which we just talked about. Arrest records, especially for nonviolent crimes, are very biased. Um, so all, automatically, um, someone who is um, poor, someone who is minority, is much more likely to have higher recidivism risk just from that kind of data. But on top of that, there's questionnaires. And I looked into the LSIR model, which is the sort of oldest and most popular version of recidivism risk, but I'm sure many of you have seen the ProPublica report on the COMPASS model, which has similar kinds of questions. And they are proxies for race and class. Number 29, do you live in a high crime neighborhood? Couldn't get much more of a proxy than that. Um, number 17, have you been suspended from high school? We know that suspensions from high school are proxies uh, for race. This is a bar chart explaining how many more black boys and girls get suspended in high school than whites and other races. Here's the thing that horrifies me the most. Number 26, did someone in your family go to prison? So if, if a, if a lawyer stood up and said, Your Honor, please sentence this person to prison for longer because their father was in prison, that would be tossed out of court as unconstitutional. But it is embedded in a, a scientific risk score given to the judge as fair and objective, and the judge is expected to use that um, against somebody. I'll just point out, Obviously, this does ruin individual lives, but it engenders one of the most pernicious feedback loops of all. You have high risk scores given to you because of your demographic as much as what you've actually done. That leads to longer sentences, and then when you finally get out of prison, you have fewer resources, fewer connections to your community, less wealth, less job opportunities, and you ended up in a desperate situation back in prison. So it creates its own reality. And I should say that I actually I'm desperate in, desperately looking for any kind of evidence that this is any better or worse than the current way that judges sentence prisoners because we have plenty of evidence that 
judges are racist already. So the question is whether this is making things worse or not. And as bad as it is, I don't know if it's making things worse. This is the optimistic part of my talk. <laughs> I actually have some hope. Um, I feel like one of the things that I've noticed is that nerds are pretty good people. They don't mean to like, create these pernicious feedback loops that ruin society, but they have never been asked to think about this stuff. So I am calling for data science teaching to include ethics, that includes computer science, statistics, and maybe math, because that's where data scientists are drawn from, and to understand their ethical obligations, sign some kind of Hippocratic oath for modeling. I don't, I'm not an ethicist, so I need ethicists to work on this right there. The second thing is we need to interrogate these algorithms. We need to develop tools, and I'm talking to the data science community out there, develop tools to understand the extent to which these, these algorithms are discriminatory um, or not. And we need to demand that regulators are on top of this because there are plenty of existing laws that are not being enforced in the presence of algorithms. So as again, the example going back to Kyle Beam that got red lighted from that personality test. The, there's, the ADA already exists. And we have these companies that are replacing their HR departments with algorithms. And there's no, there's no regulator saying, before you do that, show us evidence that this algorithm is legal. That's what we need. We need those regulators to demand evidence. And we need the tools to interrogate them to find the evidence. And finally, I think under certain circumstances, anybody who's being scored should have a view into that scoring system. So for specifically for the teachers whose job depends on a good teacher assessment, they should be able to interrogate their score on an app. That's not to say that they were given the source code, because that's not useful to most people. But if I had the source code and some UI developers, I could create something so that teachers could first confirm their score and then do a sensitivity analysis in the sense of saying, what would have happened if I had um, this student had gotten this score? What about if, this, if I had been teaching at a different school? And they could figure out how sensitive or insensitive these scoring systems are to these kinds of small per perturbations, which by the way, my suspicion would be they would be terribly sensitive to it and it would be like immediately thrown out as completely stupid. I'll answer questions now. Thank you, guys. All right, that's super fun. So now is the question time. Um, questions, raise your hands. Um, people will run around with mics and make certain to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Ben Zeffenbergen. I'm from Princeton University. Um, so I'm an ethicist or a lawyer ethicist, so I'd, I'd love to work with you in this stuff. Um, you speak louder. Okay. Uh, so I'm one of those ethicists that you refer to. Oh, um, but um, what I see a lot is that these, um, so I, I advocate for a way of talking through projects for an hour or two and really getting through the assumptions and understanding what the algorithm does uh, and then maybe adjusting it on, on certain parts. Um, but I'm on, under a lot of pressure by companies and governments and also academic researchers to automate this process. So to automate the normative decision making about how to design an algorithm or a technology. And my answer is always, you can't do that. You, you can't, however much training data you give it, you can't automate or, or keep automating these kinds of systems. Do you think it is possible? Um, and I, I think, to be honest, a, a monthly meeting of two hours on ethics of the thing that you're doing in your project team is going to be much better than an automated system. It's a really interesting question. I haven't thought about it because we have so few tools right now to check whether something's fair that I haven't even gotten to the question of like when do you start that conversation. I will say though that it's certainly not enough to have good intentions, right? I don't want it to be like, oh, we've we've designed it really well so that it's fair. Um, but we're not going to check afterwards if it worked, right? Because you can easily fool yourself into thinking that you've designed something fair, um, but the proof is, a, is in the pudding. You know, you need to actually um, change it, look at it after, after the fact and say, well, now it's done. Is it behaving fairly? Um, which isn't to say that you shouldn't do that in the first place, but you can't stop there. And the other point I wanted to make was like, even if we had an auditing system that sort of declared this thing to be unfair, 
which I would guess would be most of the time. I don't know actually how to go back and make it fair. And maybe that's what you would learn in those two hour meetings, which is very useful. Hi, ooh, this is nice. <laughs> uh, Baratunde Thurston, and I wanted to follow up on this idea of labeling an algorithm as unfair. We have uh, increasing calls for transparency in like the fashion industry, in fair trade coffee, in organic stuff, and good housekeeping seals of approval. Do you see uh, that we have a demand, uh, a need to demand such for these before it's too late? Like, is there a point at which we could actually create a culture of some level of transparency and like maybe an algorithm to rank the algorithms? And then if those algorithms felt like they were being unfairly treated, they would understand how we would feel, you know, like if an algorithm <laughs> developed consciousness about its own rating, then it might be better and it would tell its maker to be better, <laughs> like recursively. Wow. Um, yeah, I'm not worrying about that particular concern. Um, I did start a company um, with the idea of getting hired by companies that are using algorithms um, and worried about the legal legality of their algorithms. And I started a company to audit algorithms, and I would be developing algorithms to audit algorithms. Um, uh, I don't, yeah, I don't, I really haven't thought much beyond that. Like the book, it's gone really quickly, and I'm, I'm really amazed by all the, the wonderful reception of the book. But the book was like, yo, we have to start worrying about this, right? And in terms of what, you know, what is it gonna, this field gonna look like in 10 years, I'm hoping very much that it's big and it's important and that people care about it and that academic resources are put towards it. Um, I don't know if that's true. Um, but I do know that this, if we come up with a kind of good framing, um, of how to audit these processes, then we could apply that to other fields, and I think we probably should. It's a question of what is evidence? You know, what is evidence that this decision-making process, which is, we happen to know is algorithmic, but it doesn't have to be, what's the evidence that this process that we use to make decisions is fair? Um, and that's a question that's so general. It actually has very little to do with machine learning per se. But if we can think about it that in that generality and come up with some good answers and develop definitions of evidence, and I think we'd, we'd, that would be a big advance. Uh, uh, we have seen recently a lot of uh, social fragmentation, polarization, and so on. And uh, have you done any thinking on how much these uh, uh, feedback loops and self-patuating patterns uh, generated by algorithms are actually major drivers of this development. Yeah, I have. Um, which isn't to say I've been able to measure this stuff, right? Because I don't have access to Facebook data. But, you know, I think that the design decision early on at Facebook to show us stories that our friends are, think are like, um, which was probably very, very parallel to the decision to keep us on Facebook and mollify us and just make us feel like buying stuff. Um, so we'll click on their ads. That was a design decision that has had incredible repercussions, right, in our, in our hyper-partisan world. Um, and on, layer on the top of that, the sort of entirely new field of micro-targeting with political ads and altogether the tailored advertising situation, it's really influential. And it's very frustrating for someone like myself that when you talk to somebody at Facebook, they simply do not acknowledge that influence. They, they acknowledge what they describe, and the same thing for Google, they will, they will admit to describing the world, describing people's tastes, but they will not admit to influencing people's tastes. So they're like, we, we are measuring the, the, um, the present, but we are not affecting the, f the future, but they are. And, and we don't have access to their data, so we can't we can't measure that influence. They could, but if you look at the list of articles written by Facebook research, they're often, their conclusions are often like, Facebook is a benign or positive influence on the world. <laughs> um, so it's, it, it would be tricky to do because so many people use Facebook. I mean, ideally, you'd find an alternate universe where Facebook were never introduced and measure how partisan they are over there. And so I'm not saying it's trivial, but I feel like this is like a very important question and there's no regulation in sight as far as I know about it. Um, so it's frustrating. 
Thanks. Um, my name is Dahlia Levine. I am an ontologist. I work with taxonomies, and I'm an information architect. Um, so I work for a media company. I can't say. But um, all right. So in the beginning of your talk, you were talking about um, defining success of the algorithms. And one of the challenges I have is that when I'm trying to get the engineers who are working on the algorithms to talk to me about the language that they're using, because through the language is how we can, well, I found that you can say like, hey, just by choosing what you call something, you're introducing a bias. So I wanted to get your, um, how have you thought about language in the algorithms or language in the data sets and what, what influence that is? And is that a way to evaluate them? Is that a way to find the evidence that you're looking for? Yeah, so I mean, I was a little obsessed earlier in my talk about the, the difference between people who are rearrested and people, the reoffenders. If you listen to the rhetoric from, like, if you listen to the pe way people talk who build these policing algorithms that, or the recidivism risk algorithms, they talk about reoffenders. Um, and that, I'm just like, that's not the right language because you're already conflating arrests with crimes. So, yes. Um, on the other hand, I think it's a little bit more than language, right? So, the example I like to give is like for profit colleges or payday lenders. These are these are industries that make use of the tailored advertising infrastructure that I help build. <laughs> and what they do is they like very, very efficiently find the targets, uh, you know, poor and desperate people. Um, and they profit off those people. And by the way, like Facebook and Google profit off of advertising for them. So it's like a win-win, right? So it is, it's considered a, a success by the standards of the industry. Um, and it's only if you think about the third party involved, which is like the public at large, that it seems like, wait, maybe that's not a success. You see what I mean? That's not a language problem exactly. That's a perspective problem. So uh, Nathan Newman, I write some about uh, th these data issues. Uh, I guess, the, as you talked about it, it seems like there's two separate problems. Either the data is really stupid and bad, or if the problem is it's actually too good. And it seems like the solutions go in two different directions. I mean, with education, with even criminal policing, et cetera, if you assume there's some good faith trying to do some of this, which isn't always true, this is Kathy O'Neill and various other people coming to save the day with good math. You know, and if you can get the algorithms better, airplanes, died, maybe they can get better. You know, there's some skepticism there. But when you get to the hiring side, and you talked about the payday lending, that's where the worry is that the algorithms actually do work, and there's very little incentive to make them work less well for what they're doing. So it seems like you can educate data scientists, but you know, if people are paid to have the results come out that people end up poorer after they interact with an algorithm, it's going to be hard to get it to go the other direction. So it seems like some of the talk you were giving about educating ethics, I'm very skeptical of ethics changing the like algorithms that work for people with uh, self-interest in them working that way. I totally agree. It's kind of like asking an oil company to divest from fossil fuels. Um, <laughs> yes. So I make a point in my final chapter that the free market is not going to solve this problem because it's actually very profitable to be racist and sexist in various um, moments. Um, and the example I go back to is FICRA and ECOA, like the Fair Credit um, Reporting Act and the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, um, which was born out of like basically women complaining that they couldn't get loans from banks, especially newly divorced women. They were just shut out from loans, and they were like, that's, that's not fair. And just like just before they made a law about it, they added, you know, race too. So like the, basically, it, the idea was, even though it might be less profitable for you, you banks, it is not allowed to take into account gender or race when making a credit decision. So it was an explicit decision um, that a regulation would strike a balance between accuracy and fairness, and it would allow for less accurate models um, in order to promote fairness. And the idea being, you know, how, is, how are women ever going to get credit histories if they never get loans? Like, we have to, like, force you, banks, to give loans to women 
even though you, it seems like a bad deal for you, because that will give this subgroup of pop, this subpopulation the chance to establish credit histories. And it seems like ridiculous now, right? But that's that's where we were. And the the good news is, it does seem ridiculous to us now. This it, like largely worked, and women do have good credit scores. The racism problem still really really exists. And I claim in my book that there's good reason to believe that the peer-to-peer -peer lenders, which is a new kind of like loan industry, living on the internet for the most part, they don't use FICO scores. So they don't have to follow FICRA and ECOA. They don't have to follow those laws. They bypass those laws very explicitly. And there's every reason to believe that they are using whatever, whatever information they can, probably race, at least proxies for race, to make more money. So I call for the extension of those laws to the era of big data for that reason. And I also, you know, extension in like philosophical extension, like we have to just choose as a society sometimes to be more fair, even if it means those private companies that use data algorithms will cry because their models will get slightly less accurate. Like, well, maybe some of them will close, that will be too bad, but it will be a fairer world. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you so much for that talk. That was really, um, really great. Um, so my question, I guess, is getting back to, and you started answering it in this in this question, but maybe I want to push it a little bit further as to your provocation for us to Please push do. you around. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm wondering about the theory of social change here. So beyond regulation, beyond government sort of intervention, which I think is important, the education of data scientists also very important. Um, I'm coming at this from this uh, very, I guess, a very personal side of seeing my dad, who was a New York uh, public school teacher, get pushed out because of these systems, um, and seeing him blame himself, yeah. right? Um, so I'm wondering, because of the cultural power that these systems have, do we need an Occupy algorithms? Or, you know, like, what it, would that be helpful? Or, you know, from your perspective of being deeply embedded in this stuff, yeah, yeah. Um, is there a more popular movement here? Yeah, I, I think it's so important that you bring that up. So many people I interviewed really talked about the shame they felt. And I feel like that's, it's so, it's so, it's so sad. And it's, it seems like there's a, just a human impulse um, when we are given scores to take them as like more than what they are, right? We take them as like reflections of our worth. Um, credit scores, teacher assessment scores, BMI, you know, like all sorts of numbers that associate, we can like literally know that the system is flawed. And in the case of recidivism risk, like that I'm being labeled because of my, where I was born, not what I've done, you know? And it still hurts. It's the shame, it's just absolutely. Like, so one of the reasons I wrote the book was I was like, this stuff is not, it's, it's not the truth, right? But it doesn't mean I can actually remove that shame. But I, I do think it's, it's also, by the way, I should mention, the shame part of it is part of why people don't push back. It's actually, promo it prevents people from like organizing politically. So I mean, if, you know, I'm gonna ask the question that one of you is thinking, which is like, how do we fight back, right? Like this is, and I, I, like, to, I like to say, this is not a math test. I'm not gonna say everyone should go take math. No, like this is not a math test. We do not fight fire with fire in this sense. We don't say, oh, we're gonna build algorithms to fight um, against the algorithms. I mean, I, I personally do wanna build some algorithms, but like putting that aside, like what did actual teachers, what do teachers do, right? Teachers should say, like, fuck the math. Like what you're doing is you're a... <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah, yeah, no, it is. But like, what what they should say is like, wait a second, let me get this straight. There's there's a black box algorithm that's just spitting out numbers, and we're expect like, and we're gonna not get tenure or possibly even get fired based on these numbers, and you can't explain them to us. They don't tell us how to become better teachers, and we're supposed to just suck it up like that. That is essentially you trying to hold teachers accountable, but we can't hold you accountable, and it's not fair and we, we have to complain to our union rep. You know, this is a political fight um, against, a, against power. Because this, at the end of the day, like this is, again, not about math, this is really about power. And these are very useful tools of power um, because, again, people are afraid of math and they trust math, but at the end of the day, they're, if they're not fair and they're opaque, then they are 
tools of the power, of the powerful. Hi, I'm Abe Cohen. Uh, I worked at the Shaw a decade before you. Uh, I was also a teacher for a short time. My wife was one of those people that were pushed out, but not because of an algorithm. So, yes, the algorithm definitely looks like it's biased. It's probably fraudulent. Uh, the problem with regulation is it's, it's a city, and the cities, are typic cities and states are typically exempt from federal regulations. The union doesn't do anything about it. The union is very helpful in certain things, but not in preventing older teachers from being pushed out. Um, but the other question that I have, and the real question that I have is, yes, this is biased, but the principal evaluations and assistant principal evaluations are just as biased, and what do you do about that? And what is the, what is the ultimate solution to that? Great question. So again, and I'm gonna go back to my like criminal justice example, like that's a messed up system, right? And I, and I'd love to make it a better system, but I'm saying that this is not a silver bullet that everybody's looking for. And that's the same thing with teachers. I'm not saying there's no bad teachers. I'm just saying putting a random number on everybody's forehead isn't gonna find the bad teachers. Um, and the question of how do we find the bad teachers is a really hard one. And I have personal opinions about it. <laughs> but I'll say that if we are gonna use data to do it, the, the data system we put in place would have to satisfy two properties. One, it would have to be have a ground truth attached to it, right? So this had no ground truth. The, the value-added model did not have, we didn't compare the scores of teachers to some kind of important yet expensive qualitative assessment and say, oh, it's, it aligns pretty well. We didn't do that. We, the argument was like, it's too expensive. We can't do that, not even for 20 teachers. Like, we couldn't do it, right? So there's no ground truth. And when you have no ground truth, that goes to the second thing, you can't iteratively improve your model, right? So remember I talked about optimizing to success over time, um, like with my dinners. Uh, or just think about the Amazon checkout line. The Amazon checkout line, you might not love Amazon, but like that's a good freaking model. And it's because if they showed me products that I, didn't, I wasn't interested in and nobody like me was interested in, and we never clicked on, they would eventually be like, oh, that's not a good choice. We're gonna show Kathy and her her friends like stuff that she actually might want. It self-corrects, it gets better. And the way you self-correct in a context with people like teachers is you, I'm imagining this, you give them a score, but not just a score, also feedback, and say here's what we think you could do more with for your students in, and the teachers give feedback to that feedback saying that wasn't useful feedback, or that was useful feedback, and now I know how to teach my teachers better, my kids better. In other words, we have a, a healthy ecosystem where there is feedback and there's correction to mistakes, and right now, we have nothing like that. I'm not saying it would be easy to do that, I'm just saying that's, if it, if it existed, that it would have to incorporate those properties. Hi, uh, my name is Ian White. I'm interested if you could talk a little bit about in the era of big data, the kind of the, the death of causation, the death of statistical theory, and you've got a you know, generation of data scientists, formerly known as statisticians, who kind of may not, not low, might not know a tremendous amount about this. So when we kind of get into the case of policy, people are already not armed with the right intellectual tools to, to kind of go down the battle. Great question. Um, I was trained as a quanted hedge fund in statistics. I didn't take statistics before I went to the hedge fund. I was a number theorist. Um, and I never, we never talked about causation because honestly, it didn't matter. We were like, if we can predict the, the market tomorrow, we can make money. Who cares? Why? Who cares why? Um, the problem is that that, has, that attitude has been inherited into situations where it really matters. And I should add the sort of the twin c lack of concern that we had in finance is we didn't have to be right all the time. We didn't have to be particularly accurate. We could just be, we could just guess right 51% of the time and make shit tons of money, right? So we were like, we're, it's better than guessing. We just had to be better than guessing and we did not have to understand why we were better than guessing. As long as we were consistently better than guessing, we did have a measurement of statistical significance, but so imagine that being applied, that attitude, and which is exactly what's happening, being applied to things that really matter to people, like recidivism risk score, right? Where you're like, Oh, this is, we don't have to care about why. Why, you know, people in, in poor black neighborhoods have a higher risk of recidivism. But guess what? We do have to care. The, the point I, I make a lot when talking about the Compass model and the ProPublica analysis versus the North Point 
retort. I don't know if you guys have been following this closely, but the point of this question of accuracy versus fairness and stuff that people aren't talking about enough is the, the causation, right? Why is this algorithm accurate and at the same time gives blacks much higher risk scores than whites? It's only accurate because policing is so in uneven. So another way of saying that is if the police suddenly stopped scrutinizing black neighborhoods way more than white neighborhoods, that model would fail. Its accuracy would plummet. It has nothing to do with the behavior of people, of the, of the defendants. It has to do with the behavior of the police. So what we're doing, if you think about what causality means, like you're supposed to like change something and see if the results change, right? That's a proof of a lack of causality, right? What we're doing is we're, we're assigning people scores not because they are themselves responsible for this all. We haven't even tested to the extent to which they're responsible for it. Um, but so there's all sorts of other things going on, societal things, choices about policing, et cetera, historical bias, whatever. But we are uh, putting into a score and assigning it and giving people personal responsibility and punishing them for it. It's a problem. <laughs> you got me. You got, I'm agreeing with you. I would love to see that as part of the ethics, by the way. Like part of the understanding of your ethics is understanding to what extent are you blaming people for things that are beyond their control, right? That is what we're talking about when we talk about causality. Hey, Kathy. I'm Jonathan. I teach computational journalism at Columbia. So I'm, you know, my students and I are, are live this on a day-to-day -day basis uh, because I'm training them to try to analyze algorithms. And so one of the key problems there is, how would you know that an algorithm is fair? So let me run a, something we've been talking about in class by you, and I'm curious to th see if you would think this is a fair algorithm. Uh, for recidivism, um, so first of all, you don't train it on arrest data. You train it on convictions for violent crimes. Um, and then you uh, get a calibrated ac uh, output. So you know, 20 if it says you're 20% likely, 20% of those people actually are reconvicted. And then you try to equalize the error, error rates across the categories that you care about, such as race and so forth. Would that pass the fairness test for you? It's a really good start. Um, I'm not the arbiter of fairness, by the way, just FYI. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I'm loving this discussion. I think it's, it's a, like, as I said, the thing that kept me up at night, I'm so glad we're having this conversation. Um, absolutely, one of the things I insist on, and this goes back to your question of like, of intentionally trying to make things fair from the get-go. Why are we using nonviolent crimes that we know people are arrested for for no good reason at all, and it's not really crimes like basically being poor or having mental health problems, right? We should use violent crimes because we know that they are less biased. And there, by the way, that's one reason. The other reason is because if there is a reasoning for judges using recidivism risk to put people into prison for longer, that reasoning is public safety. And the public safety is much more, we care much more about violent crimes than, than nuisance crimes. So let's focus on violent crimes. I love it, so glad you're doing that. The other point you're making about the error rates is a really important one. So going back to the, the ProPublica report, the ProPublica report basically said the Compass Recidivism Risk Model is racist because the false positive rates for blacks is twice as big as for whites, which is to say twice as often blacks are are labeled as high risk, sent to prison for longer, but then they don't actually end up back in prison. Those are false positive rates. North Point has come back and said, we don't care about false positive rates at all. We only care about true positive rates, whatever. The point is that we haven't taken into account the harm by mistakes of algorithms. And we absolutely must do that. And it's a, it's a really good way of thinking about it. I, I'd have to like sit down with you guys for a longer to understand exactly how you're thinking about it. but. It's definitely on the right track. You're welcome anytime. Great. Hi, I'm Jonathan Cohen. I work in public health at Open Society Foundations. You said this was about power, and of course I completely agree, and I'm wondering whether um, conflicts of interest is something that came up in your research and a big part of this. So are the people grading teachers linked to the charter school movement? Are, are the people coming up with the recidivism algorithm linked to the prison industrial complex. And in addition to seeking a freedom of information request on the algorithm, 
asking, you know, wh who's contracted to do this and what other clients do they have and trying to do the power mapping that way and creating a sense of scandal around that because it's a technical problem, it's an ethical problem, but if it really is about power, there has to be a kind of methodology for addressing that as well. Great question, and the answer is I haven't done any of that because I was like, my expertise is data science stuff, and, and the thing about the value-added model for teachers is like it's so shitty in its own right that I don't have to think about that, but I do think people should think about that, and I do think it's related to this push to privatize uh, schools, and if you looked at like the Chicago teacher strike, it was the argument essentially came down to the question of how much of a teacher's assessment will be the value-added model. So it's extremely political, and I didn't wade into that because I was like, I don't have to because it's so statistically flawed, but someone should. Um, yeah, so that, that actually kind of touched on the question that I was going to ask, but I had two questions that were coming up. The first was, you know, I know it's much easier to, um, within the work that you want to do, hold things to a legal standard. But what does that mean after such a prolonged period of deregulation that we've seen in areas like labor? Um, and then the second question was actually, yeah, precisely what he just asked. In what cases are we translating a, a business ethics question into a data ethics? Yeah, I mean, look, I want everything to get better, but... <laughs> I, I'm going to start with things that are illegal and unin, like already illegal but unenforced. Um, and I feel like what's great about that is we'll develop tools that will generalize because there's there's really nothing specific about hiring algorithms that are racist than anything else, um, or sexist or or discriminating against people with mental health status. Like once we have those tools it'll be much easier to make the case to regulators like, hey, like, this is another arena in which we're, we're seeing really problematic patterns and we already have the tools to check for it. Hey, why don't you let us check for it? And you know, in other words, it's like, a, it's a process and I wanna be pragmatic. And, and moreover, I also don't wanna ask for everything at once because then people will be like, oh, forget about it, so you're asking for too much. Like, no, let's focus on weapons of math destruction that are currently harming people and are illegal and then we'll move from there. <laughs> <laughs>